six from around the world by showcasing their professions, passions, and perspectives. I'm your host, Mathir Singh, a.k.a. The Net Nehan. Why Guruji ka Khalsa, Why Guruji ki Fateh, Tarun Singh, Hi. welcome to the Net Nehang's Arena. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. You are the founder and CEO of a company called Tarun 3D, Correct, yeah. where you produce 3D type content. And it varies across many categories, and, and we can get into that a little bit later, but you're doing like virtual reality stuff, augmented reality, various other kinds of things. But like I said, we'll talk about that later because I want to let people know how I know about you. <laughs> when in the mid 90s, I would say, when websites were kind of taking off, all these sick websites were popping up or at least starting to. And that's when we, when um, I created this net nehung persona and I was making a lot of graphic art, like wallpapers for windows <laughs> themes you know so you had little sound effects or your icons might be a little kunda and stuff like that i was doing stuff like that and it started making some sick websites and at that time there was only a couple SickNet was one of them that just started and the six.org was another one and uh i had created a a website for sick youth federation that was in north america and then um one for Ontar- ontario sick student association and uh eventually akj.org but at that time i remember 3d uh artwork 3d um um design was all pretty new and kind of cutting edge at that time and man you must have been a young man at that time and you yeah. were doing stuff you were actually creating stuff when nobody else was and i tried to dabble in it a little myself but I found it very difficult. It takes so much painstaking detail. So why don't you give us a little bit of background about yourself, you know, where you grew up, you know, what your Sikhi life was like, but then how did you discover 3D design and 3D animations and, and talk about a little bit, some of that early stuff. Cause I remember being blown away back then and we're talking about 20, 25 years ago. <laughs> Yeah, I know. Yeah, I think it was uh, 1999 I first set up my website um, mm. and it was called Siki Art at the time. Um, and yeah, I was uh, I, I was pretty much a gamer from young age. So that's, while I was at school, I was gaming, you know, playing Doom at that time. It was yep. Wolfenstein, all those types of games. But I was really interested in sort of like 3D animation and gaming and creating the content and creating games. So I started to sort of like get hold of free software and start playing around with it. I mean, I had a really kind of old computer at the time and I just started to try and create, you know, you know characters. I wanted to, uh, it, really what I wanted to do was create like seek computer games and seek animations. And yeah. uh, so that, that's where the kind of like the passion and, you know, the, the kind of the website came in. And yeah, I remember that that time there were many websites out there but there weren't many seek art websites either right. like uh, i think there was uh, y- y- yourself doing stuff there was SeekNet doing some stuff and then there was um uh kenyan gala singh doing oh, his yeah. amazing wallpapers do you remember those back in yeah the day? yeah you see he's still around as well so i always yeah. uh, every time i see him online it's really lovely to see him again because yeah. like you remember those old times when there was only like you know there's limited resources and I remember like uh, being able to get Keith done online as well. It was the first time people were uploading in uh, real audio at that time because it, you know we were all dial-up connections and stuff like right. that. So yeah, so I designed the website. I mean, I I I pretty much self-taught. There was no sort of um, kind of formal learning or formal teaching. I was just messing around at home on my own machine and just teaching myself. And I did a lot of the posters around that time. So whenever there was a camp, so Gyanmi Sukhasing used to do the Yep. Uh, Stratford Road camp at the time, the Nordwan Academy um, camps, and I used to make the posters, and I would base each of the posters on a classic sort of computer game. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so some of them old uh, it, it, for the, for those people who are gamers, yeah, they could look at those old posters, even though they're C camp posters, yeah. 
they're actually based on computer games, but I, I had a lot of fun with that. So yes, yeah, you know, it's funny you're saying that too, because that's actually the same thing with me. Um, I was a gamer. I was playing all the same games, Wolfenstein 3D and uh, yeah. Doom. And I was a huge Quake. I was, I was competing yeah, in tournaments and stuff yeah. in university. And, um, you know, and I loved it. I was obsessed with them. We had, we were in a, a Quake clan. Me and my friends, yeah. we were on the Quake clan online. And I was doing all the uh, designs for all the um, skins. And, yeah. and so I was into the gamer, the un- kind of this underground gamer website world which is what I was basing, like the original AKJ.org and all that, it's kind of based on those gamer websites, that yeah. style. That's what I always liked. That's what was fun for me. Yeah, you know, yeah. so a lot of my designs were also kind of based on that. And even the Netnehung logo, my little avatar, yeah. you know, it's, it's kind of supposed to be like those gamer avatars that people like to use. So <laughs> that the yeah. same thing with me. Everything was kind of coming from that subculture. And, and I think we were trying to make it cool, and it, we were trying to show, right. like, we, we, we came, like, I, I came to Sticky when I was, like, 15, 16, like, in it, uh, when I was a teenager, and, uh, like, you know, obviously my family wasn't, uh, you know, that much into Sticky, we'd go to the Gudwara, and then, um, you know, I, I kind of came into this Sangat, and, um, you know, it was, it was just, like, mind-blowing, like, that we had all this sort of spirituality and such a rich history such amazing characters and just stories in it. And, and my thing is stories and it really, it was all about the stories and I wanted to share those stories, but I just thought that most of them I shared verbally. Uh, mm-hmm. But the thing is my communication has always been visual. So I've always communicated through drawing and through art, through characters, through animation. And so I just, I was trying to move all these, diff- all these amazing stories into sort of like the 3D realm. And right. like at that time, there was no sort of YouTube and there was no um, kind of there weren't very many resources to learn from. You'd see a lot of really great artwork online, but there wasn't a lot of instruction um, at, at the moment. Now, it's amazing. I mean, you can learn pretty yeah. much anything you want. Like yeah. you, could, you can get, you can access it. But at the time, there wasn't. So a lot of it was just trial and error and just having a go. And I remember one of the first images I created was of the of, of Guru Granth Sahib Ji. I remember um, that, the, yeah. With the light and stuff, yeah. And kind of like... Um, that yeah, kind so of that, became that. the iconic 3D image of the time. I mean, everybody yeah. was stealing it and using it, I think. <laughs> yeah, I was, I was happy for everyone to use it. Like, I was yeah. like, yeah, look, there's something out there that we, we can use. And I was like, yeah, like, I never really intended to sort of, like, uh, brand it or, like, you know, copyright it or anything like that. Right, I always, right. I, I, the idea was for it to just go out there and just people to be able to enjoy it and just be able to use it and, you know, um, be able to benefit from it. Really. And I think that kind of theme sort of um, has just been there the whole way through, like in, in, in everything I've done. Yeah. I mean, um, I can see it like in your artwork, you are making things cool. You're, you're producing like these um, characters that are, um, similar to the kinds of artwork and character you see outside of, you know, like the key things. Like if you're looking at like uh, comic books, video games, movies, um, the quality or the level of the work, like detail, for example, like um, that uh, the star, the Kali, the star that you made, you know, the detail on it, like the texture of the fabric or like where the wire, the rope that gets wrapped around, it's imperfect, right? Like it's, it's loose somewhere or it goes a little bit quick. Like that detail makes it so real. So like, I think that was the cool thing is like, you were able to take these characters and make them look like the superheroes and things that we see yeah. otherwise, you know, and they feel real. They don't feel cartoony or silly or whatever. It was like, Oh wow. Look at look at how cool that person looks. Look at their the star, or the proportions of things, or the textures on the chola, the way that the folds are. You were able to capture all that. Now you're telling me you were self taught in that. Did you ever get end up getting any um, formal training or education in this? Actually, it's been like a like a yeah. It's just a recurring theme throughout my life. I'm I'm sort of like I am on the autistic spectrum, so mm. I'm like quite quite kind of far down the autistic spectrum. So I. I'm an autodidact, so I self-learn like in it. Uh, can pretty oh, much. wow. I just found from a young age, I just had this sort of ability to just learn uh, software or, you know, technical pieces of software and be able to have the sort of um, 
kind of just dedication and focus to just train and learn. So for especially for the sculpting and the artwork, yeah. it's it's been a very sort of long process. Like and it's been like slowly just practicing, practicing, and then you know studying anatomy, studying all, all these things, studying heritage, studying heritage objects. And I was very lucky because I was surrounded by you know collectors, people who are collecting traditional weapons. Okay. Uh, so I started to incorporate those into my designs. So the fir- early ones are kind of like quite fantasy based. But I think um, I think you need to hit the nail on the head where what I was trying to do was like wh- where we were looking at the paintings or we were looking at the historical images. They were done like they were done like 50, 60, 100 years ago. Right. And they weren't sort of um, they, they weren't necessarily communicating very well with this current generation. So what I want to do is just mo- modernize those images, put them in a new format, which would be appealing to young kid, you know, young people these days. Right. Like what we want to see in it, because we're used to seeing like Batman and you know uh, X Men right. and you know uh, um, you know Marvel and things like that. And, you know, I was a ma- massive comic book fan as well. So um, it was really, it was really. I'm I'm trying to sort of like sh- just portray these people. Um, you know, h- historical shahids and especially the shahids, I think it's just one mm-hmm. thing I've always had like, uh, like a just a affinity or affection for them, uh, yeah. like sacrifice that they've made. And so for me, it's always been about telling their story. And yeah. uh, I think when, when I first did the, the first statue, which is the Garja Singh one, yeah, and um, you know, the whole point was I wanted people to see it and then ask who it was. and you know, and then tell the story of, oh, actually, this is by God. I think it's not just a like a fancy sculpture. This person actually existed. And even though it's like a reimagining or an artistic, you know, uh, interpretation of, uh, you know, how they would have looked. But I've used like the traditional, uh, you know, artwork and just like you modernized it and used, you, you know, used, um, you know. And, and I think even when I'm going through, when I'm when I'm modeling each of the parts, I'm able to look at authentic um historical artifacts and mm. it actually led to me working on a uh, the, the anglo sikh virtual museum right so because i was always modeling up swords and modeling up the shields and stuff as a friend of mine from leicester um uh Gurinder singh man he's a historian and yep. he kind of said to me well you know it's and, and i felt this as well he said look there's certain things certain artifacts from sikh history which are not available anymore either they've been lost or stolen or they've sort of uh been changed like the kohinoor for example has been cried to the queens and we can't see them in their original context so um you know and, and then guru gobind singh is you know, I, I believe in maharaja amarinder singh sorry uh, I, I think the maharaja patiala's collection so it's still there yeah. and um um you know it's I, I just think it's a shame that my kids are never going to be able to see that Right. You know what I mean? Like, you know, it, we've got artifacts out there, but we're, they're not put on display. You know, we can't see them. And things when you see historical artifacts, because I, I, I worked in a museum for a, 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 for a time as well, Birmingham Museum. And, um, you know, when you see these artifacts, Roman artifacts, uh, you see, you know, artifacts from the Middle East, you know, Mesopotamia, all these different places, it kind of makes the heritage real. Yeah, 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 definitely. If there's something you can see and feel and touch, it kind of makes you think. Well, once upon a time, yeah, there was somebody who, you know, who who actually carved that or who used that part or you know, right? It kind of real. It makes it real, and I just thought we haven't got that. Everything seems to be sort of like you know, imagination, like in it. We have to imagine that how it was when the artifacts already there. So the first job that we did there was to recreate the of Guru Gobind Singh yeah, and we didn't have access to it we just had a couple of photographs but I was able to um, recreate it um, from the photographs like copying you know how the Gurbani was written copying right. all the patterns and I mean it's not like a hundred percent replica but I would say it's about 97 percent like it's pretty yeah. accurate and it's you know uh, where, where you haven't got the real thing it's like it's, it's pretty much and and then we were able to sort of um, do that again and again with different artifacts. So we went to the Royal Armouries uh, Museum in Leeds. We went to the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. And they've got like Sikh instruments, Sikh of the stars. They've got weapons. They've got, um, you know, so many things. And we picked some of the key, key sort of artifacts 
even the Kohinoor, so we, we made a 3D model of the Kohinoor, but we put it into its original context. It would have been war on his arm, it would have been war on a crown. Oh, wow. So we okay. Were, I didn't know oh, that. I didn't, yeah, I didn't really we think about that, it. actually. Yeah. So we were able to put it into its original format, in its original shape, and show people on a touch screen or in a VR headset, you know, or even in an augmented reality tablet as well, uh, and have kids sort of explore it and have a look at it and realize that actually these people were real and the history is real. And these artifacts are proof that they existed. They so wait, when you said that, like you made it the 3D model of it, mm-hmm. of the Kohinoor, um, did you, how, like, how long does that take to make that model? And then how, what is the process? Are you making like a general model quickly and then whittling it down to the details or, or, yeah. or is it like painstaking details? How, like, how do you do that? Yes. Yeah, so, so what we do initially is we, 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 we try and understand and study the shape of the object. And then we will do something called, like we'll do, like, you know, just with, like, same as drawing, you know, when you're drawing, you'll draw a rough shape first, and then you'll right. refine it in three stages. And we do the same thing. So we'll create a rough shape just to get the, an idea of the scale and the volume of the object. And then what we'll start to do is we'll start to sort of uh, cut into it and add more detail in the second and third sort of phase, like in it. So, it, it, we, 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 so first of all, we're just trying to get the shape of it right. And then after that, we're trying to like uh, add as much detail as we can. All the interesting bits, all the sort yeah. of scratches, all the you know um, extra little adornments that are on there. And we I were see. able to do some of the jewelry that belonged to the family of uh, uh, Maharaja and Jeet Singh. Um, so, how and, long would like each one of these items take from start um, to finish? They were taking us like anything from like eight to twenty-five days, like in it. Some of them took oh, months, wow. months to. Uh, do some of them we were able to do quite quickly but we actually became quite fast at it um, I see. you know we, we can do it quite fast now because we were always looking for new techniques of doing it so um so I've, I, I've been training as a traditional sculptor so i can sculpt in clay as well so i go to sculpt retreats so I, I you know i i, I learn I, I go to um um uh, learn portraits sculpture and anatomy and all these sorts of things so I, I go quite regularly and it's kind of like a hobby. It became a hobby of mine on the side because yeah. my work is actually in um, so my, my work. In, and, and this is the thing. Actually, my whole career and everything, yeah, uh, came out because of the seva that I was doing. Like, if it hadn't been for the seva, right. like, I probably would have just been a layabout, like, and just playing games at home and dotting about <laughs> on computers. <laughs> but, uh, but because of, uh, like, or, or because I was trying to use the technology for Siki, um, I actually became quite proficient at it. I ended up, you know, I didn't really get any qualifications at secondary school. I just worked in sort of design jobs, you know, TV stations, museums, you know, worked on websites a little bit. But uh, and then I made my way into architecture and engineering because I knew how to model 3D quite intricately. Uh, buildings were quite easy for me. So I worked for interior design companies, uh, worked for engineering companies, architectural companies. And I ended up doing a master's in uh, computer. So I did a master's degree in computer aided design for construction. I specialized in game engines, so um, the, the immersive side of things. Uh, like the Unreal Engine? I mean, yeah, the stuff Unreal that Engine, I'm seeing. Yeah. Oh I, my I, God, yeah, Unreal incredible. Engine, the version 5 has just come out, yeah. I actually okay. started on Unreal Engine 1. Oh, wow. <laughs> so I started using Unreal Engine 1 in 1997 when we were playing Unreal Tournament. And, you know, I made Yeah, because there wasn't Duke Nukem supposed to be on the Unreal Engine and then it never came out. <laughs> yeah, it never came out. Yeah, yeah. I remember Duke Nukem. Yeah. <laughs> I, I actually, I remember Unreal, uh, Unreal Tournament 2, two which is made yeah. in Unreal Engine 2. I actually made my own Sing character for it. So oh, wow. when we were playing Unreal Tournament, I was actually playing as a Sing. Oh, like, that's with awesome. With and stuff. So that was really cool. So I was always like modding games and doing things like that. And I think a lot of this, a lot of like, uh, you know, uh, you know what i do it's just like it's just passion just hobby like and it's just personally well it shows i think it shows in the details in the work you know and there's a couple of things like i have some questions for you because yeah. i want to understand this better I, I love this all this kind of 3d stuff but uh i recently tried to get uh, a, a 3d uh, net hung done yeah. right and i went on fiverr and i found a guy and mm-hmm. and when he was done i was like all right you know he it was okay like didn't quite capture some of the proportions and stuff that I wanted, but I was like, okay, so now like, um, how, how do we re you know, move this guy around or position yeah, him yeah, in different ways? Yeah. He's like, Oh no, no, this is not that kind of, this is a sculpture. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it can be 3d printed yeah. versus like 
a 3D model that can be used in animations or yeah. things like that. It's they're two totally separate things. I didn't realize that. Can you can you kind of explain what is yeah. the difference and and how do you work differently in those? So so yeah. So um, initially, when I'm working on the characters, I'll sculpt them digitally. So I use a, a software called ZBrush, which is a digital sculpting package used by the film industry and the game industry. Uh, so I sculpt using that. Um, and then once I've, I'm have i happy with the character, then I will create a, a low polygon, like a, a simpler version of, of, of that. Then I will bake the details in. So I'll transfer the detail from the high resolution model into the low resolution model. But then that character, that, that model has to be rigged. So you have to, in a way, put a skeleton inside of it. Um, once you put a skeleton inside of it, and then you have to attach, you have to sort of uh, weight the, 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 the skin of the character to that skeleton so you got to tell it that uh, the forearm bone will you know be be kind of driven by the forearm bone and then and so on and so on and there's a bit of like fall off in between that uh, and then you will then you can animate the, the you, what you'll do is you'll animate the skeleton not the actual character and then the character will just move along with the skeleton so it's kind of like that sort of process rigging process um and um I'm trying to explain it without getting too technical, really. But, uh, <laughs> no, it's okay. Get as technical yeah. as you want. It's I mean... kind of like, yeah, it's you, you create this digital skeleton and then you attach it to it. Now, we, we've just recently acquired um, a motion capture suit. So, oh, because wow. my dream has always been, and this is what everything everything I have done, yeah, has been sort of aiming for one thing that I've been trying to do for the last 20 years, yeah. And, yeah. Like, I haven't done it yet. I failed, like, um, well, it pretty much all throughout that time, yeah, I failed to do it. But I'm still kind of trying to do it. Like, and I'm not going to give. No, up. that's the they all. That's the saying, right? You yeah. fail your way to success. That's exactly, what success yeah, is. Yeah. So, so yeah. So uh, the idea is always to create this, like, you know, kick-ass, seek, uh, uh, you know, uh, animation, like in it. And uh, you know, we're getting really close now. Like, we're you know, dangerously close at the moment now because we've got a motion capture suit. Like, uh, we can design the characters and we can do the environment. You know, and I think all this time, yeah, I've just been gaining experience. Like I feel like, like, uh, like I work for engineering companies. I work for like, you know, uh, software companies, TV stations, and you know, places. But all the time, yeah, I was just trying to hone my skill and get the all the all the. All oh the my god, this is, that sounds incredible. To kind of, I'll tell you, like in my head, I actually have like a a sick based science fiction story yeah, yeah, yeah. that i've always wanted to tell i thought i always thought maybe i'll make it into a comic book or a graphic novel or something yeah. um and it's 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 true like science fiction and sicky like yeah and now i'm hearing you say that i'm like oh man we need to talk afterwards yeah, yeah, yeah. maybe we could make this into a series or animation <laughs> I, 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 that, that, that's what we're aiming for at the moment but obviously in the meanwhile yeah obviously we've got to pay bills and we've got to right right see like do you do you so do you get paid on any of the sicky stuff you do or you do that all like um, as seva well with the sicky stuff it, not so much yeah i haven't it's always been it's always been like i i i i've always liked to keep it as that's my sort of that that, that i do that for the love like in it that's the and, passion and, and 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 i enjoy that yeah and i didn't want it to be sort of tainted by sort of you know, money and cash and stuff like that. And obviously when I was young, right. I was more naive about it and I just didn't want to get involved with it and stuff. And so I would do it and I would just get a lot of joy out of it, basically. And yeah. that was enough for me. Like, and it, I, you know, working, you know, I'd pay my bills through the jobs that I had. But then when I was doing sicky stuff, it was just for the love of it. And yeah. I really, I really liked that because it kind of freed me a little. There was no sort of pressure on me to, that you right. have to sort of, uh, you know, like in work, there's pressure. You've got to get projects done. You've got to, you know, work to certain. You know, with this, it was just like, well, it could be whatever I want it to be. And it's like, and you're more free and you're more playful with it. And I found that sort of quite liberating. So I like to keep it like that. I mean, recently, uh, when I did the God Justin statue, that was about three, four years ago, I did a Kickstarter campaign. So yeah. I put it on. Like, actually, I'll, I, I, I'll, be, I'll be honest, like when I was doing it, I was just making it for myself. I just yeah. wanted one for, I just wanted like a really... <laughs> awesome looking like warrior thing like on my you know because i had um like um wolverine and some of the other ones on my, right. my table and stuff and i was like oh man you know who's wolverine in it i'd love to have a thing there like in it so i started building it and and my you know my friend would come down from london you know Diljeet, my good friend of mine 
and he would say, "Yo, when you get it done, yeah, you can make me one as well." And so <laughs> and then somebody else came down, and while I was there working on it and sculpting, I'd be talking, you know, without having a chat, and they would say, "Oh, when you make that, can you make me one as well?" Like, and everyone that kept happening, yeah, everyone who came down was like, "Oh, can you make me one as well?" And then the jeep said to me, "Well." Because you might as well just do a Kickstarter campaign and, you know, let let everyone, like, purchase it and stuff. And I was like, okay, I'll try it. And, like, with a lot of, like, I was really scared, really fearful about it. I thought, well, nobody's going to buy it. Nobody's going to want to invest in it and stuff. So I set it up, uh, set up the kick, Kickstarter campaign. It was, like, £12,000. And like, yeah. I was scared that it wouldn't get funded. So I put it down to, like, 40 days. And... It actually got funded within like four days or something like that. Like oh wow! Yeah, and we hold yeah, because I I would imagine there is a big demand for this kind of stuff. Yeah, but no. what is the process exactly? I, it, are you're, you do you have to three D print it? That's how that's the way that you actually yeah. produce the sculpture. So, so at the time, um, so first off, like three D printers were like stuff of dreams when we were doing three D stuff back in the day. If you did something, yeah, longing on the screen. So yeah, um, I, uh, I I was creating my model. I was sending it off to a three D print bureau. They were printing it. It's quite expensive. It would take a bit of time. They would send it back to me, and then I was able to look at the prototype, make some changes, make some structural changes, and you know just just get a chance to see it. And um, uh, eventually, because of the Kickstarter campaign, because you know everyone sort of you know we, we had a massive influx of cash there, and so I was able to buy myself two three D printers. So. Uh, oh, what, nice. what I'm able to do now is I can, uh, you know, sculpt something and I can print it within a few hours, have it within my hand and have a look at it. So I've got two yeah. printers. One's an FDM printer, which prints some plastic. And then I've got a very high resolution um, resin printer, which can, prints really high detail where I printed all my masters. So what I do is I printed my master and then I had to. So uh, every single time, yeah, there was always, there was always something new to learn. So I kind of learned how to do casting. So I learned how to make silicon molds and cast, you know, cre create a silicon mold from my 3D master and then pour resin into it and create the copies. I see. Because um, you couldn't 3D print all of them. It, it would just take too long and it would be too expensive. So, yeah, so um, the, way the, <coughs> the way the 3D printer works is, um, um, so, so the, the first type, which isn't very detailed, um, it's basically a, a, a spool of plastic that goes into a, a hot end, which is a heating mechanism, and then it pushes it out through um, a very fine sort of um, um, kind of uh, like point. a pinpoint yeah. or something. Yeah, yeah. The, the the point little tiny little hole in the uh, I can't remember what it's called now, but yeah, so it heats up the plastic and it pushes it through, and then it uses the x y coordinates of your three D model to actually lay out the plastic. And so that's really great for prototyping. Yeah, it's like it's like printing, like almost like putting yeah. icing on a cake or exactly, something. Exactly. Yeah, just, yeah, that's, yeah. That's, that's that's exactly yeah, like a cake. And then, but the other the the resin three D printer is completely different. It has a vat of liquid in a in a in a in a in a like a uh, in a little vat. And what happens is a platform comes down and right to the bottom. So you have got a really thin layer of um, you know resin in there, and then a laser cures it from underneath. And so. It, Oh. Cures it layer by layer by layer, and it peels it off, and then does the next layer, and it's able to do so. The F FDM printer, the plastic one, that is able to do like point two, and I, uh, you know, point two millimeters each layer. So you get these sort of lines in it, and then with the resin printer, you can actually go like, um, you know, micro, like you know, sort of point point five of a millimeter, like really really tight fine. So you can get these like perfect sort of sculptures. And you can do really intricate stuff as well. So I've been able to do jewelry in there. I've been able to reproduce some of the objects that we 3D modeled. Um, I'm currently actually 3D modeling the Bunga as well from the, the, the Royal Armies, the one that you yeah. described. So I'm doing that at the moment. Uh, but um, just recently, um, I've been. Yeah, just for, just for people that are listening or whatever, we're talking about the, the star that was like very tall and long and it has various chukkas and kundas. It comes up and has to a point in. I mean, it's really cool. Like, I know that 3D model, that image you, you put up. I, I, I was looking on your Facebook page. I, I don't know what all the social media you're on, but um, the detail is just incredible. I mean, when you're looking at it and to think it's not real, it's a computer image. It's just, it's, it's just amazing. Yeah. I mean, we found when we went to the Royal Armouries in Leeds, I mean, they were, even they were shocked at how much detail, because we did a shield, a Lahore shield. Yeah. And they were like surprised at how real we got it. And we got it working on mobiles. We got it working on augmented reality. We had it working. We, we got it working in VR so you can actually pick it up. 
You can actually pick up mm. the Seek Shield, you can pick up the Seek Shield Sword, uh, the, uh, there's, a, there's a Star Sword there. And, you know, and, and when, when I see, when we take it, when we take it to like the Gurdwara or we take it to like events or the museum and I see little kids use it, that's yeah. where I see like this is amazing because they're able to hold like a, a, like an ancient Seek Sword in their hand. They're able to yep. pick up like a shield. They're able to pick up an old, you know, um, Nishan Saib. Uh, they're able yeah. to see a cannon right in front of them. And so I, I really sort of, w- when I was like working with immersive technology, when I was working game technology, I really saw what it could do for, you know, and, and, and essentially the Sikh community were not great at telling our stories. Yeah. You know, we're not, we're not great at telling our story. We've got some right. amazing, we've got amazing content, but we're not yep. very good at sharing it. And so, um, you know, and, and one of the things I've always been like concerned with is how can we uh, uh, prepare the next generation like in it? How can we prepare content? How can we educate them, you know, in, in formats that are more kind of palatable for them, uh, more accessible for them as well? Because they're digital natives now. They're growing up with iPads, mobiles and stuff. So we need to be creating. And, and this is my thing has always been we need to be creating computer games, animations. Uh, 3D animations, right. and we need to be going beyond just reproducing what's in history as well. Like you were talking about the science fiction stuff as well. We need to be putting ourselves into the future as well, like and into those right. stories, and you know, and and retelling those stories in different ways as well. So um, I, I think that it's really important now with with young people where they're consuming so much media that we are so behind in terms of the content that we can educate them with. And what's happening is they're losing touch with their heritage. They're losing touch with Sikhi. Because, because it doesn't feel real. It's like yeah. what you said, when you're interacting with these, uh, even these yeah. 3D objects, it does make you feel, it brings it the reality of it mm-hmm. to life. I mean, two thoughts that came to mind when you were saying that. Um, one was, um, <clears throat> take like the Incredible Hulk. Yeah. You know, for a lot of people, the Incredible Hulk character is more real to them. Yeah. And people will go online and argue about the physics of the Hulk or like, no, he's this strong or he's that strong or he's this heavy when he crashed into a building. This, I mean, it's so real to them or like a Star Wars. No, lightsabers don't work that way, you know, or, or a blaster uh, would be, you know, you know, blah, blah, blah. Like, or this ship should be moving this way. This is all imagination. None of it is real, it's not but real. it feels so real to us that we can actually yeah. argue about the details, and, and, and right? Yeah. So when you have, when you're creating these objects and people are interacting with it, it brings that reality to them that, oh, I get it. I understand how it moved, how it looked, how it felt, or how it would have been used. Like the reality of it comes together rather than just saying, oh, he had a sword in his hand. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And I think being able to see them, and I think we're, we're growing up in an era where everything is visual like yeah. everything is 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 personified everything is you know you know seen and um you know we we need to sort of update ourselves and and make sure that that and, and i think especially with the gorgeousing statues and especially why i do the statues as well is i just feel that when you see it and i i, I just wanted young people to look at it and see it and just say i want to be like that when i grow up and because we've got right. real life superheroes in our in our history, in our, history. In our heritage, yeah. like you know, by Fodja Singh, Baba Deep Singh, you know, Sanjanel Singh, all these, all these amazing like Sheed Singh, Singhni yeah. Ayer, and I'm yeah. just like, you know, what I mean, we like I, I, I sometimes you know telling my kids and stuff about about their stories, and I'm like, these people did superhuman things, yeah, like you know, it's it's great they love these Marvel Marvel films, but like you know, it's not real and it's all fantasy, whereas yeah. our superheroes they're all real. You know, they're actually yeah. People. Yeah. Yeah. Try to try to be 40 people against 10,000, yeah. you know, like Im- imagine that is that's superhero esque. Right. The other thing that I was thinking, just rela- this is kind of a tangent to it, but um, my last episode, I talked to Gurmeet Gore. She does the folk tales of Punjab and, yeah. and that kind of stuff. And um, she was talking about her visits to Pakistan and Nankana Saab and what's going on there. And I- I'm in real estate. So like I'm a real estate investor, I, I you know, and a broker and, I deal with real estate stuff. And while she was just talking, she kind of just passively made the comment that uh, there are 18,000 acres there at Nankana Sab in Guru Nanak Dev Ji's name. Wow. And then it took a second and I stopped. And I said, wait a minute. What do you mean? Like there's a deed with Guru Nanak Dev Ji as the owner of this property. 
And she's like, yeah, there's all, there's records. It's all recorded. And Baba Nanak is the owner of this 18,000 acres. Mm -hmm. And that hit me like a ton of bricks because that's my world, my real estate world. I was like, that is, that brings Guru Nanak to life. That makes him real. You know, like he's not just this guy in the Sakis and, 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 you know, and where we kind of detached the human, human form from the Guru, which fine. There's this sense that you do that, but, don't forget that this was a real person and the and that his name is on the deed. <laughs> you know, that's incredible to me. That makes it real. Right. And it's I feel like it's the same thing with these kinds of things. But I wanted to ask you, like, so when you 3D print these, how big are we talking? Like, are we talking about like a Yeah. So so my, my 3D printers are quite small. So I've, I've got some examples here actually I can just bring them up. So if you look at yeah. uh, for example that one, this is uh, yeah. Uh, by God, just think one in it, and so this is about twelve inches. So I did a sort of like a, a, a you know, twelve inch um, um, version of this. Yeah. Um, and I'm actually moving these a bit. I'm actually moving higher in scale now because I'm, I'm ordering a new 3D printer that can do larger prints. So these will usually be cut. So there will be cuts underneath there. There'll be cuts where the cut eyes, the way you can make the joins. And then there'll I be see. like, you know, in, in even the base as well, there's sort of, you know, um, th- th- there's like cuts going in. So it's, it's actually see. like um, the shield is a separate piece. So it's about six different pieces that are then put together. I see. So you can you can print a lot larger than what my printer's space have like in it, what space I they see. have. But yeah, and I mean, recently I've been doing, um, um, I've been doing these smaller ones are like easier to do as well so these ones are being like easier to do I'm yeah yeah i saw those online printer. yeah and 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 things these are quite easy and and, and I'm, I'm trying to start off like, like smaller but this is a test that i'm doing for a new one and um you know oh yeah so and thing is each each of the items on this and i mean this is a bit busted up because um it's just a prototype each of the items on this i was able to model up specifically so the shield uh the bow actually has uh, so w- one thing I found is whenever I've looked at paintings, yeah, they always get the bowls wrong. Um, okay. So I was like, so? determined to get the bowl right because um, um, uh, cause I, I, I teach archery as well to like little kids. So I'm an uh, yeah. archery coach. So what are, what are they getting wrong with the bows? And so the what painting? they tend to do is it's like the shape of it. So they tend to do it like a sort of like uh, a, a classic sort of shape where they would have been using like horse bowls which are more smaller. And if you look at the examples that they've got, so all the whole wooden horse balls, the, the reason that people probably aren't, you know, using those because they don't last very long, you see, because they're made of wood. By now, they're uh. deteriorating. And the only ones that are left over are the metal balls. So people tend to copy the metal balls, but they were more ornamental. But I'm, I'm pretty sure in those times, they would have been using sort of uh, composite balls um, or okay. horse balls. And these were, you know, obviously these were brought into India by the Mughals and they were far superior to anything the Indians were using. Um, I mean, it's how they conquered most of sort of like Asia. And so I, I would see the Sikhs using the same sorts of bowls that they were using at the time. Um, right. And also the string as well. It's not like a thin string. It's actually a plaited sort of string. Um, it's oh, still okay. plaited. Um, and then it would be... Uh, you know, and, and I've seen it's not like a thin sort of like line. It's actually it looks like a plaited sort of hair sort of thing. And there's actually and the good thing is you, when you go to places like the Royal Armouries in Leeds or you go to BNA, you can actually see these items. They're all there. So I just I started to sort of like actually base everything on on, on those. You know, what did the um um for example, you know, what did the archery equipment look like? You know, yeah. they didn't use to hold the bow like this. Um, they would use the thumb draw, so they would have held the thumb, I see. you know, like this, and use the thumb ring. So whenever we see them doing this or anything like that, that's like a modern thing. In that time, that's they modern. Would, they would have held it like this, more like in it, and so so little things like that. So if you see it in the Singhni sculpture that I've done, which is with Bihar Sharankor, um, where she's holding the bowl, where she's just slightly ready with it, you can she see that she's holding it with a thumb, with a thumb ring. I see, and, and just little things like that are, are being like really kind of. Uh, just yeah. What do you think about? Right. Or, yeah, no, the details are awesome. That's well. that's the thing. Yeah, he's getting the weapons right as well. So with God just saying, yeah, like he's got a Zulfikar sword in it, which is quite you know quite you know just a mean looking sword. 
And yeah. then he's got like a Kukri style sword as well. And these are all modeled on actual weapons that were around at the time. So it's quite likely that they would have been using these weapons. And it, it kind of changes it as well because, um, it, it, like you said, it makes it more real, doesn't it? It, right. it makes it more kind of, oh, I can see, I've seen that antique weapon. I've seen this. Well, and, and you're making it historically accurate, right? Yeah, and so I, that kind of just adds to it. Yeah. But, but what do you think about, or, and what do you know about um, the claims of how much draw power was on the bows of the Gurus, like Guru Hargobind Sahib's bow and Guru Gobind Singh's yeah, bow? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, the numbers are insane. I know, I know. some like, of the numbers are insane, but if you look at, um, like, the, the, the Mongol bows and the, the Mughal bows, I mean, they were really really high sort of um i think they were like uh, going up to about 200 250 even some of them uh i mean there's there's stories of some of them who were um you know when they were when, you, you're talking are you talking about uh um are you talking about pounds or are you talking about i think it's pounds of pressure yeah, so what, what you do is you put the bow on a on a nail and then you put yeah. weight on the string and you wait until it gets to i think it's 28 or 30 inches and then that gives you the weight of that bow Mm. yeah so how many pounds of pressure does it need and so yeah. um like i generally work on like a uh i think uh up to a 45 um yeah which would be normal that's the yeah, kind of normal. normal and then language. even some of these hunters may be using up to like 80 pound draw pound, yeah. which you have to be in pretty good shape yeah, yeah still to do yeah. like i i could i can pull a 50 pound draw but i've got kind of a small guy but um i mean after about like after about like 10 15 minutes my arm starts to shake <laughs> Yeah, so accuracy goes, but yeah, I mean, like, but the thing is that they were they were like you know two hundred two hundred fifty pound bows. Uh, the Mongols were using just as normal. That was their normal every day. There's stories of when their bodies were exhumed, like one of their shoulders was actually bigger. Like the the, the oh you know, right the, right the, from the, from the, the work of doing yeah bigger because of the you know their things. So yeah, so I I mean I don't know like you know. Um, you know, what exactly they were using, but, you know, it's highly likely that they were using in that range of, you know, 250 to 300, you know, because... Yeah, I think um, some it, of the story, stories of Guru Gobind Singh's bow is like up to 400 pound draw, yeah, yeah. and that it used to go, th his arrows would go through three or four people. Yeah, definitely. And, and you know, those bows arrow. actually existed, but they weren't pulled with uh, arms, they were pulled with your legs. So there are oh. some bows around which, which, which you could pull with legs, and they were like really sort of you know, and then those, what you got to remember, they became sort of like, um, they, they evolved into sort of like uh, the, the kind of siege weapons as well. Oh, right. So, right. yeah, so they, you know, when you got the big bolts that were pulled back and stuff. So yeah, they, yeah, like the big crossbow type. Yeah, yeah. So they were like, yeah. you know, five, six hundred pounds sort of, you know, um, weapons. But yeah, so it's, it's just really interesting to get into that, you know. Um, now, what about, what about like different other weapons, like, the guns and stuff that were around. Have you looked into any of that? Are yeah, you replicating yeah, any of those things? The matchlocks and stuff like that. I've modeled up a couple of matchlocks from that period. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Some of that stuff's really cool. Uh, I think cannons. I've done a couple of cannons from my oh, yeah. time. Uh, we've done quite a bit of jewelry. I've done some instruments actually, which is quite interestingly from the 1700s. Oh. Uh, we've done a saranda and we've also done, uh, I think it's a, uh, dulse. Yeah, okay. So the, yeah. yeah, and, and the, I, th I think the other thing is like uh, we've got to remember like how many of our Sikh artifacts and objects are in British collections, like in it, <laughs> British right. institutions. Yeah, like in it, I've been down into the archives of uh, the Royal Armies, and I've seen some amazing stuff down there. Like, oh, really? Really crazy stuff. And I think uh, that the, the other thing is like it's it's that sort of supply and demand sort of thing. It's never brought out put on display because our people don't traditionally don't go to museums right. and we don't go to museums because we don't see our items displayed so it's kind of like a chicken and egg situation like in it right right it's we don't like, see our stuff so we yeah. don't bother going and if we don't bother going they don't put our stuff on display out, so, but even if they did we would yeah. look at it and be like hey that's ours yeah yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so they, they are worried about those claims as well so yeah um and i, th I think yeah so, so so many things have come out i've got to say you know, when they say that's, you know, out of Seva, you know, Seva is always fruitful. And I've got mm. to say, my experience has been, it always has been because um, all, all the work that we've done, it's always been able to be involved in projects. I worked on the Sikh Cyber Museum in 2000 to 2003, which is a website all about Anglo-Sikh history. 
uh, looking yeah. at the British archives, the Imperial War Museum. Uh, I did it with a friend of mine called Joe Gussing, who who is also like an amazing designer. Um, and you know, we worked together. On yeah. That. So yeah. So are there a, how many of you guys are out there doing this kind of stuff? Um, is it just like you and your friends, or do you know of other six independently that have been doing three D art and I design? I think with the three D starting to happen now, where we're you know. I, I get a lot of young people like contacting me and saying, look, I'm getting into 3D and stuff like that. And then like, I actually teach 3D as well. So we, I, I teach at, uh, ver- you know, various institutions. So at, uh, the universe, local university, I'm part of the steam house there. So we teach digital sculpting, 3D printing. Uh, I teach at the Unity Center of Excellence as well. Uh, and I teach for master.com as well. So we're mentoring the next generation of people who are coming in. And we're like actively encouraging, you know, and informing. Uh, and we even go to schools as well. So I got to actually go to schools as part of my business to encourage young people, especially girls, to take up um, STEM subjects and engineering, yeah. and 3D, you know, uh, creative jobs and things like that. Because we, what, what we're, what I found is that there's not much diversity in those areas. Right. Not you know, so we'd be going to conferences and that, and then you'd, you'd probably be. You're the only thing in the village, you know. So uh, right. <laughs> trying to encourage younger people and diverse audiences into there, that's another like uh like passion of mine is is, is increasing the sort of um you know uh access to diverse audiences and bringing them into this sort of field, uh, engaging with them, helping them understand and learn. And so we run the Birmingham Unity User Group, which is like a free group that runs every couple of months and you can come and learn about the Unity game engine. Um, huh. And we also run Handless Innovation Hub, which is quite recent, actually, uh, where we run community events where anyone can come along and they can learn about new technology. So we had a cybersecurity event and we've got an NFT event. And it's just oh, an okay. accessible place for communities because they're not going to go and walk into the university and start learning about NFTs. But if we do right. at the local community center, they're more likely to go in. And if the parents are informed, then they'll be telling their kids, you know, uh, well, that's, I think that's where the problem is, right? Because yeah. most parents are pushing their kids to doctor, engineer, yeah. you know, the traditional things, make sure you can get a good, secure job, and yeah. then you can play video games all you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just get the, yeah, yeah, my, that's the my, attitude. My parents used to say, you know, you're playing in the community, it's not going to get you anywhere in it. And I'm like, hey, <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do you like me now? Yeah, so, <laughs> yeah, speaking of which, so Thudder and 3D, um, this is a full-blown company making 3D design, yeah. artwork commercial material you're you're doing things like you can make a um virtual reality 3d model of some brand new car yeah that's coming out you can showcase the interior you can move all around this car There's, you can show all these details but it's all happening in virtual reality um so can you talk a little bit about yeah, yeah, the so work that you so guys do I, I mean it seems like you're doing like some of the coolest yeah things like it sounds so fun <laughs> So yes, yeah, so I, I uh, w- after I did my masters and um, you know I, I specialized in like interactive visualization for for architecture, uh, but really I was trying to make deep computer games here. But um, uh, the thing is, I came out of that and then I went to work for. I was already working with architects, you know, doing visualization. Three D modeling was really easy for me, and so like they were used to just doing blocking and and massing, and I was able to do like texture and. You know, work really closely with interior designers because they're all about the texture and the feel and the and the lighting of the space. So I worked for an engineering company for ten years, and I was just doing research and development, immersive technologies. I was using uh, Flash. Remember the Flash uh, back in yep, the day? Yep. I was using Flash to create interactive applications, looking at sort of uh, environments, lighting, energy feedback, you know, sustainability. And so that was really great. But after ten years, like I was starting to feel like. You know what I mean? This isn't what I really wanted to do. Like, and it this was this was just so that I could learn enough so that then I could create what I really yeah. want to create, uh, which is what I'm coming to, like in the future, like in, in the next sort of five to ten years. And I decided that you know I I was getting sort of stagnant as well. Like, and I was like researching and producing the same sorts of stuff. And while the company loved it and it was all going really well, I just wasn't happy within myself with what I was doing. Mm. So I kind of left about three years ago. I left my job um, and started my own business. So I can, uh, a bit of a crazy thing to do. But, um, you know, I yeah, it takes guts. You, there's, there's so many other fun ways to use, uh, you know, immersive technologies. And I'm going to go out there and start talking to people. 
what I found is like a lot of people didn't understand how it works. What it, you know, how does a VR headset work? What can you do with it? You know, how could we use it in our business? And so I just started to teach people. So I would turn up at the university, turn up at different places, and start talking to people. Go to schools, colleges, and start talking to people. Talking to museums, talking to uh, automotive companies, engineering companies. Uh, managed to get my first contract with a uh, with an engineering company who were wanted to use VR, but didn't quite know how to do it. So I was there as a consultant, helping them to understand new technology, doing some of the work with them, and showing them the examples and teaching them. And literally, the business sort of just came out of that, like in it, and uh, mm. you know, just helping people uh, and being as you know uh, uh, informative and educational as I could be learning you know uh, and teaching and you know that's just how the business has grown and we actually created the augmented reality um version of the commonwealth games mascot so the commonwealth games yeah, can you can you can you explain uh what is the difference between augmented reality and virtual reality yes yeah, so, so so virtual reality is where your whole reality is replaced by a different scene so you put a vr headset on something like this so you when when i put this on yeah i can't see anything else so i put this on and I can't see anything right. else. And that is virtual reality. So it's taken over your reality. Yeah. Um, you still, yeah you're immersed in that environment. Yeah, that's it. You're, no. you're in a completely different place, completely different environment. Augmented reality is different. You use it on your mobile phone and you're able to project a 3D model into your environment, but you only see it on the screen. So whether that's a tablet, whether that's a, a, a mobile phone, whether it's uh, a HoloLens, so, um, you know, th th this is a VR headset. You've got a um, mixed reality headset, which basically has cameras on it. And then it shows you what you're looking at. And then it projects the 3D model into the middle of the room. And oh, so that's, wow, okay, that's yeah. kind of like called mixed reality. It's like, a mi you know, uh, yeah. they, they all kind of like, they all come under a banner of XR. So you probably see extended reality. Yeah. But XR yep. is basically VR, AR, and MR. Uh, mixed reality, augmented reality. Augmented reality and mixed reality are very similar. There's, I mean, there's yeah. experts out there who will fight over this yet about the two. Yeah, it's a philosophical stuff. difference, right? Because right, kind of you're like, looking at yeah. you're looking at a digital image. You're not yeah, actually yeah, looking yeah, at the yeah. real thing. So, so there's a philosophy but, there. <laughs> but but what's happening now is like we're going to be getting glasses. So Apple are creating glasses, which will be augmented reality. So they'll be able to project onto the actual glasses an object, track it, and then keep right. it in the same place. And so we're able to do that now. We're able to do that. So we actually created, so during the pandemic, you know, usually there's a guy in a suit, there's a mascot, goes out and has fun with all the kids and everyone. He couldn't yeah. do that because of the pandemic. So when they approached us, uh, we created a 3D version of the mascot. Yeah. So we, oh, wow. we sculpted the 3D model and then we made the skeleton inside. We animated him and then we put him into an Instagram filter so then everyone could you know, stand next to him and take a photograph with him. And it was a really wow. successful campaign. And, and and from that, we were able to work with, like, uh, you know, manufacturers in America, um, working with uh, medical companies. We're working with automotive companies as well, working on some, like, you know, uh, training applications and visualization applications, working with architectural companies, working with a lot of heritage companies now, uh, sorry, heritage organizations, helping them to, engage young people because they're, they're right. trying to engage young people bring young people into heritage but sometimes they're not interested because it's a very passive experience when you go to the museum and you're looking at artifacts behind a piece of glass whereas we're able to put, you know make it so you can pick up the sword in your hand using vr and ar so um yes yeah, so th those are the type of st stuff that we're doing in the business and it's kind of interesting because i never really wanted to run a business i never wanted to start a business <laughs> It was, wasn't something that I wanted to do. It was like the last thing I want to do. And so I was yeah. a bit of a reluctant sort of uh, business person, really. Uh, but I really. Yeah, but that's that. like that saying if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I have a lot of. Fun. So, let me ask you. Okay, sorry, let me ask you something real quick, though. Um, so, as far as implementing things like a virtual reality or maybe even augmented reality, let's go with the virtual reality for a second. Um, what do you see as a possibility of doing things like a Kandpat or Kirtan Smagams where virtual Vajja, virtual Tabla, virtual Sangat, you know, yeah. but everybody's participating, really participating. They're just in their homes with their headsets yeah. on, but having quote unquote Sangat together. You know, that, do you see that as a possibility yeah, or is that definitely, something? Definitely, I, I see, definitely see it as a possibility. I think it, it's, 
um, the, the way that I can, like we're using VR at the moment. Um, and I'll give you an example. We've got an engineering company who've got a, a manufacturing plant and it, there's a, got a piece of equipment there that they can't take offline. If they take it offline, okay. there's a cost of, you know, thousands of pounds a day they're going to be losing if they take it offline. So how do they train new people to use it? And mm. so it, that's an ideal situation where we can create a VR version of the actual um, equipment. We can put all the controls in, and then we can actually automate the teaching of, of how to run that equipment, how to maintain it, uh, or what the emergency procedures are. And so what it's doing is it's putting the power into the hands of you know the people it's making things more accessible to them. Mm. It's making people. It's making people available to learn remotely, and that's where I see it helping in Sikhi as well. So I have done a VR version of like a. I did a meditation um, chamber. So it's a version of the first image of Guru Granth Sahib that I did. But mm. it's a VR version. You actually sit in it and you're on the water and that. I don't know if you've seen it on oh, uh, I don't think I've seen that yet. Yeah. I've got oh wait, is that the one where there, it's like a figure with a light? And Coming I, I can show you actually. Can I yeah. I'll share my screen and I can kind of Yeah, I see yeah. it. Yep. So if I play that, this is like this is actually the, the, the you're in this chamber and you're it's it's quite surreal. Wow. And it's basically my new version of what I did twenty years ago, like twenty, twenty five years ago. But this is yeah. actually interactive now. So it's actually an interactive uh, 3D environment. You can put a VR head. So like, wait, when you say interactive though, what do you mean? Like you can walk around there and touch you, yeah, you could, the Ramali yeah, you could. and stuff in, like that? In this one. So this, I've got the VR headset on and you can see this is me actually looking around with the VR headset. So oh, wow. It's a whole 360 environment that I can sort of sit there and you're on this sort of ocean and you see Maharaj in front of you and you have Simran in the background and you can just like, Get out of your get out of your headspace and focus a little bit. And things I don't see this replacing. This ain't gonna replace Sangha. This ain't gonna replace the Godwara. You know what I mean? But I see these sorts of experiences are gonna sort of help people engage. You know, so somebody who's oh like, yeah, hundred you know? percent. No, I mean, think about people who are um, maybe they're confined to their homes for medical reasons or something, and they want to participate exactly, yeah. in, in Sangha. You know, they can use tools like this or even something like. Um, maybe you're learning Santya from somebody who's in Punjab yeah. and you're in America or something and you can go to this, both enter this virtual room, look at the same virtual Guru Granth Sahib and read and they can listen and correct and show you where to pause or whatever. This, there, it, it's amazing. That's There's so much potential there. So I was going to show you this as well. I know you got Keith and going in the background, but this is actually online. So... This is an online. Oh, this is a web based. Yeah, this is web based. So we've got a web based sort of 3D environment. This is just a base model of Harmonda Sahib. But um, so you can see how um, that, yeah. that could be used. But um, the, the idea is we're, we're actually working on metaverse spaces at the moment. So um, these oh, okay. are like uh, persistent sort of 3D environments online that everyone can log into. So we're using these for education. So you can take multiple people into these rooms. Uh, but we're also working on language. So I'm working on a couple of language games actually in VR so you can teach young kids Punjabi. Uh, so these are like simple games, That's a bit awesome. like Beat Saber, you know, where you were just like picking and, right. and different letters will come up and then you have to identify them. And it's, the idea is to make it as fun as possible. The more fun you can make right. it, the more sort of, um, you know, the, the, the more the more kids will engage with it, the more they will sort of um, learn from it. And, you know, that that's where we need to get to, really. We need to get to the fun part where we can... Yeah, because, I mean, like, like okay, it's one thing, you know, you can have all the kids run, you can tell them the story of Chumkorsa. Mm. There's another thing where you can actually recreate the yeah. scene and be present yeah. and get a different experience out of it, you know? Um, or even just, like, I, I, you know, I don't know, I'm just imagining things right now, but, like, imagine that during Guru Gobind Singh's time, Singhs are in cores, they're all in the jungles, they're hiding, they're surviving, but it is Amrit Villa time and everybody got up to do Nithnam together. Yeah. And you can go sit in that and participate in that. You know, like things like that would be yeah. amazing to re to ex recreate those experiences and then participate them in them. I, th I think because VR is being used a lot for mental health at the moment. So where you've mm. got like patients or you've got people who are suffering from trauma vr is a really good way to sort of 
you know, disconnect them from, from you know, from their from their environment and put them into a space where they can start to sort of relax or be, sort of, you know, and and especially for people who aren't very good with sort of traveling and stuff like that. So there's so many different uses and like we're, I'm, ex- I'm trying my best to, obviously like uh, time is limited and we're trying to work. And, I, and I've always been on this sort of, uh, it's always been this way that, you know, we're, we're working hard, but then we're developing in our free time as well. And it yeah. was just something that I just accepted. It was like, it used to frustrate me uh, when I was younger. But uh, as I've getting older now, I've just kind of accepted it that look, this is a very slow uh, process. We just need to take one step each each day, each week, each month. We move one step closer and we'll yeah. get there one day. You know what I mean? And that's the main thing. As long as we keep moving, we will get there one day. And the business is the same thing as well. The businesses don't just sort of like build themselves. It's a slow, painstaking process. And it's that it's having that sort of um, resilience, really, to kind of stick it out and say, and, and learning things as well. And I think for learning, resilience is the most important thing because yeah. anything you start to, like when I started to learn how to program, I was absolutely horrendous at it. Like I hated the whole process, but I stuck with it. And I can like, pro, you know, I was programming my own applications now and, you know, I'm able to create games for our clients. You know, we're able to do character animations. Uh, we're able to yeah. create like... Um, and and things we are on the cutting edge of it, and it's really, it it surprised me actually because I I when I first started the business I thought there'd be loads of this sort of stuff out there, and right. there, there actually is yeah there's a massive demand for our services at the moment. Well, I think there's a there, there's a very very technical nature to this type of work, but there's also a very artistic yeah. nature. You have to have kind of both of those talents to excel in this. Yeah. And and that's the USP that we've got. That's why our business has done really well, uh, because we're not just technical and we're not just creative. We're able to work in both areas yeah. and we're able to bring them together as well, because a lot of it, a lot of what we do for engineering and architectural companies is all visual communication. And yeah. we are actually helping them to communicate their ideas, their concepts, their products, you know, their environments to their clients, you know, in the most effective ways, you know, really putting someone in there and letting them ha- have, have an experience or understanding of what, what it is that they're building or making. So yeah, that, right. that's there. But obviously the, the main aim for me, right, the main sort of goal has always been like, isn't it? we're going to create this kick-ass characters and we've got a motion gap to do and we're going to create this amazing animation, which I'm working on at the moment. And uh, it's like being I mean, that's so cool. Like, I'm really looking forward to yeah, seeing that stuff. Yeah. That's really cool that you got a motion capture suit. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's a game changer, right? Because it is, it is, it's yeah. one thing to create the models, and it's another thing to add the skeleton. But to uh, cap to be able to animate in a way that looks realistic and natural, yeah. you need tools like a motion capture suit, and I imagine Definitely. they are not cheap. They're, they're not cheap, yeah. But I think that's one of the things that that's one another one of the reasons why I did start the business because I just thought. I need to buy back my time because mm. I want to spend my time doing like sculpting and fun stuff, like making scene yeah. animations and characters and things and telling stories. And that stuff is really super fun. And that's all I really want to do. And that's all I've ever wanted to do. But the business has enabled me to do that because as the business is running and it's growing, it's giving me back more and more of my time. And it's also giving me um, the, the, the capital I need to invest in the equipment that I need. Like right. it, because another thing is I don't want to be reliant on anyone as well. And I have recently set up a Patreon as well. So once we start, once we start showing what we're working on, then I'm pretty sure the same as what we did with the Kickstarter, everyone came on board and the sun that really yeah. supported, supported me, which I was, I really, I, I was really kind of, a, it was, it was just lovely to kind of, you know, just to know that actually there's people out there who are looking for the same things. And so that was really nice. Yeah, I mean, look, look. I want if if I'm going to put a little statue in or figurine in my house, mm-hmm. I want it to be like a Kalsa figurine. Yeah, yeah. I don't want to put a figurine of George Washington or exactly. Thomas Jefferson <laughs> or something. Yeah, you one, know what I mean? Exactly. Like, and it really and <laughs> and thing is, I've, I've, uh, and thing is that all that work has actually come to a head now because uh, I've actually sculpted a full size Sikh uh, soldier for Leicester City Council. Uh, the oh, wow. memorial committee there so there's going to be a seven when you say foot, full size you mean like human size seven foot yeah um, oh, wow. I, I, and I, I can actually show you I've got some stuff here I'll, I'll, 
by sharing my screen. So I'll go through some of the sculpture stuff. So obviously yeah. I've been like by adjusting um you know sculpture. Oh wow look at this is some of the oh, we, so we go back go back for a second. Yeah. So that is a 3D print on the right side. Yeah. And on the left side is is that what is that that's, the same 3D that, that, print with a, some that's a digital art? that's a digital render. So because I've got that is a render. I can I can put some lights on it and then I can sort of uh you know uh put put things into there, animate it. And so that's like that would have been this this would be an animation of by adjusting like and it facing all those bullets and stuff like that. So that's just a concept image that I created. Uh, yeah, you even got how he tidies the star, yeah, yeah, keep yeah. his head together. Because it, he, he so tied cool. it over his eye in it when he, he yep. got shot in the eye, so he tied it over his eye. So that was that was really cool. And uh, I've also done other things, other sculptures where I'm trying to think about how you know what people would want in their houses, what type of things would inspire them. Uh, just to think. It, about this it. is really amazing because I'm looking at these, trying to figure out which one is a rendering and which one is real. Yeah, I, mean, yeah, that, so, I think that color. <laughs> So the top right one is a is a rendering, and then the Render. left hand side and the bottom they are printed on the resin printer. Yeah, see, even that left hand side that looks that looks fake, mm -hmm. like it, like it doesn't look like it could. It's not that it looks fake; it doesn't look like it could be real. So you yeah, just yeah, think yeah, it yeah. must be fake. <laughs> it's really smooth, and it it's, it's the three D print from it. And then obviously there's the Bibi Hasharan core. You know what I was talking about the the, the kind of um, yeah the draw on the bow. Yeah. And I think this one, I really, it was really difficult. This one was because I really wanted it to look amazing, but there wasn't yeah. enough like information out there. And so I just picked and borrowed like various bits of, you know, um, outfits. I actually really modeled the, you know, all the archery equipment, swords and everything. And, you know, try to make it as just cool and awesome as I could. Um, yeah. And just, and just, uh, Explain the story, Bibi Harshankor. She was the one that was. Um, she did the doing, of, the bodies. of, of, the, of yeah. the Saib Jade. So, after Chumkor Saib, you know, the older Saib Jade and the Singhs yep. were obviously on the battlefield. And so she went in the middle of the night and she made sure that their Sanskar was done. But obviously, when she lit the flyer, I, you know, the forces saw it. So they, so they attacked her and she fought really bravely. And ultimately, when she was wounded, they threw her on the fire. So she was threw her on the fire uh, too. She, she, she yep. was shaheed on that day. So I just thought. Um, and thing is, when I did the Gaja sing, I had a lot of uh, sisters kind of messaging me saying, "We yeah. want to sing." Me like, well, where's the female representation? Yeah, female. I said, Don't worry, I said, I'm working on it. It's taking me ages, but I am working on it. I mean, the details are incredible. Like even just the way her pajami was bunched up at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. And it's not. It's not the same on both sides. It's yeah, uneven yeah. and different. It's, it's it, kind it of, just um, makes it look so real. And, and then looking at the reference and stuff like that. And I did this one when uh, for an exhibition when uh, obviously Bob Thurukting was doing his hunger strike. Um, oh. So on the right hand side is a three D print. On the left hand side is a digital model. And then okay. these are some different ones that I'm working on. So these ones are going to be really large. Um, so I haven't actually shown anyone these. So this is the first time anyone's ever seen these. Oh, yet. wow. Exclusive yeah. on the Net Hung's <laughs> Arena. <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, so these ones, um, like, uh, yeah, these yeah. If you're just listening to this podcast right now, you need to go to YouTube or Spotify and watch the video to see, yeah, <laughs> to see yeah. these images. So, so yeah. So, um, yeah. So these are new ones. These are actually going to be really large. Wow. Um, like, uh, you know, about, about three foot tall. And so these are going to be big ones, like in it. Yeah, you know, I'm really noticing now about the bows, what you're saying, like looking at that, mm -hmm. it is different than what you're used to seeing in the paintings. And then looking at it, it looks right. Yeah. It, it looks, it looks like what you, what reality would be. Yeah, definitely. And that's so If you cool. go to the museum, that's what it will look like. Yeah. That's the bows that were, they were used in that time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I did a couple of other tests. Oh, wow. Um, and, and then this is obviously the, the, did I, the reason I did this was because it's very easy for me to reproduce. So yeah. um, here on the left hand side, you can see actually the difference between the plastic print and the resin print. With this one, you can oh. see lines in it. And whereas this one, you can yeah. see no lines. It's perfect, like in it. But I was able to work out a technique of printing on the plastic printer, but making it look like marble and granite. And like, you know, uh, and then. Yeah, because that's what I'm looking. It looks like stone. It has exactly, a weird yeah. texture to it's it. It's actually a really light plastic. <laughs> but what I, what, oh, what, what wow. I do is I work with a friend of mine, actually, Sati. He runs uh, Urban Agalia. I don't know if you heard of him. He runs a website where he does all T-shirts and Sikh sort of items. Okay. And prayer beads. And so I'm, I'm notoriously good at 
making stuff here, but I'm really bad at getting it out there or selling it and stuff here. <laughs> so uh, when I came across Sati here and he was a nice enough and decent enough person that I just thought, you know what, he's, he's such a lovely guy and I could just 100%, I could definitely work with him. And I just said, look, if I make this stuff, can you just deal with the selling and getting it out there to people? And so he, yeah. he, was, he does that now. So I just 3D print them and I throw them at him. And then he then he's basically wow. sells them. So people, anyone wants to order these, they can order them from his website. And I, I, I that's Urban Akali. Yeah, uh, Urban Akali uh, dot co dot uk. I think or dot com. Yeah, you can check it out. He's on Instagram okay. everywhere as well. So he can order these from his website. So he does all the selling, and I'll probably be anything else I'll be I'll be selling through him because he's able to manage that process, whereas I I just can't can't do that. Like in it. Yeah. So this is actually the Sikh soldier, so the first sort of um, prototype I did, so the design. Yeah. And then um, this is actually the 3D print, the maquette that went to the council for approval. Um, wow. So this is going to be a four-foot plinth, a seven-foot statue, and it's to commemorate the Sikhs who fought in the First Second World War. And, uh, yeah, so uh, it's been a dream of mine, actually, to have a like a proper like full-size sculpture. And I didn't yeah. think it ever happened, but um, thanks to the Sunda um, in in Leicester um, and the memorial committee, you know, um, I put my uh, foot forward, and they kind of uh, accepted it. And yeah, so that's going to be going in so uh, later cool. this year. It's going to be a full size one, and uh, it's going to be going to Leicester. So that'll be really cool. Like, okay, so hang on, just real quick, stay on that picture though. So there's many components here, you know, like he's got his belt with all the different compartments on it. Yeah. He's got the rifle in one hand, um, has the star. <clears throat> is this all like sculpted out of clay type, but virtual, like on a computer yeah. and then the details are carved out or are those like individual items that you design and then stick on to them? Yeah. I, I think generally it's, like individual items that you will model and then you will sculpt and then you will stick them on. It's just easier that I way. See. Um, like the gun was made separately and then it would be sort of right. into his hands. And then obviously, you know, like I said, I've got that skeleton in his fingers so I can move his fingers around. So uh, he's holding okay. it. Um, the design slightly changed from this because um, obviously the council has their own. Um, obviously, I wanted to go with the gun hole, like where he's got the bundook and he's just about to go into battle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but the council were like no because they've got safety restrictions you know we have to pull everything back tight and it makes sure there's no holes or gaps where people can get stuck in or people can climb oh. up so yeah yeah they're thinking about a different yeah it's yeah, a totally yeah. so different the, perspective yeah, it, it, that stuff i had to learn i didn't really have a clue about any of that <clears> so i was like learning about all of that stuff and uh it's been really really nice actually it's been a lot of fun uh do working on this and it's gonna be lovely to actually see it when it's but when you do this kind of work for them, do you can you still use this model and things that you want to do for future stuff, yes, or is it yes, kind of their pro yeah. their product? Okay, yeah. So 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 obviously it's a three D print, and uh, and and that's where like that's what my business specializes in is digitizing and creating three D assets. Uh, we can we can mm. literally work with any three D data from any format. We can scan anything. We can scan environments. We can recreate objects. Um, and because we have that sort of artistic background, you know, if it doesn't exist, just describe it to us and we'll make it like in it. So we've got yeah, that sort of situation. Yeah. So we've got situations where people have done a scan and it hasn't come in. And that's actually what we did with the Hajur Saib frame as well. So um, frame that we re-sculpted for Hajur Saib. So it was a wooden frame that's been there for many years and it's starting to warp and becoming dangerous. So we were able to take a 3D scan, re-sculpt all the detail. I'm not sure. Yeah, here it is. So we have just oh, yeah. all the detail. So in the middle, that that gold thing, that is actually a rendering. So I've I've made a rendering of it. <laughs> wow, um, that's a rendering. That looks so real. Yeah. And, but, and but I guess what I was asking though was, yeah. when you do a project like that, do you own the project? Even like and you can do other things with it if you want, or do the people you commission it for? They kind of own it. And they don't want you using yeah, it in different with, with ways. The statue because they're paying for it to be built and done. Yeah. They will yeah. own the actual statue and the physical product, but actually okay. the digital version. I mean, like I could create another one. You can like, okay. I, 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 I see. can use that for animation. So, like, if like you that. wanted to for your own purpose, you could always go back and do yeah. the one where he's holding the gun like this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And that's put it, actually, put it yeah, in yeah, your that's house actually, if you wanted to. Yeah, that's actually what I'm planning to do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. 
Dog Man, that is incredible. The amount of detail on these frames, yeah. and you were able to recreate that? Yeah. So I was able to recreate it, and then it was uh, it was uh, by, uh, I think, um, yeah, it, it was a thing from Dubai who was doing the seva with Baba Kudwan Singh. And, you know, he saw, he actually bought one of my sculptures, and then he contacted me and saying, we've got this job. Um, and, you know, would you be interested? And I was like, I, I, at first, I was like really scared. I was like, oh, my God, how am I going to do this? Uh, but I told them to get a 3D scan. So they got a 3D scan, re-sculpted all the detail, put it on. We made some additions to it as well. Um, so we had some jewels placed into it and stuff like that. And it's actually went up wow. in 2018. So it's actually there at the jewel side now. I haven't been able to go and see it yet, but uh, wow. I'm hoping one day I'll take my kids and we can go there and actually um, yeah, visit. Yeah, I mean, the, the the amount of detail there is just incredible. And then it's kind of funny because I'm imagining because you're 3D modeling it, it could probably be more precise and accurate and symmetrical and yeah. right than the original, yeah, that's which is right. weird. Uh, and, and I think that's that's one thing that's that's an issue with the heritage because they they want the scratches and they want the wear and tear in there, right? So we can preserve those as well. We can mimic those right. and stuff like that. And um, so we do a lot of work with when we work with heritage is weathering objects digitally. Like and right. that's a whole that's a whole other podcast though, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I could I could I could feel like a, about ten lectures of you know <laughs> going into detail because we do we teach master classes in like in all these in all these different areas in like yeah. you know, just the just the materials and the textures and how we work with physically based uh, values for textures is like a whole right. different like science in it. Um, so yeah, that's that, and that's the yeah the Carly Turban. The good thing about yeah. this is, and we're talking about accessibility, is that uh, we made it so that you can actually access this online. So if you go to angloseekmuseum.com, uh, you can actually go online and you can actually view this. So this is actually running off a web page. That's incredible. So you can actually explore this. You can actually click on the... Uh, I mean, the light is changing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The way I the light is reflecting the, off the object is... The, yeah. The, the reflection and the... like it's, it's, it's like as accurate as we could make it in this format. Um, and if I show you like the amount of objects, so, you know, we were talking about the Kohinoor, so this is actually yeah. the original format, but this shield here, uh, that we recreated was one of the ones that I was talking about from Royal Armories. So we were able Dude, to- that's exactly, that's exactly what I was trying to imitate for my little Netanyahung logo. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this is like, um, like actually reproduced. So this is actually like the real product with the wear and tear, with the imperfections and scratches, you know? And I mean, wow. this is working off a web page. You can run it on your mobile now as well. Like I've run this off my mobile and uh, I've got this working in augmented reality. So you can actually put it in your living room and view it. And uh, this, this one was really interesting as well. And this is why I think this technology is amazing. Um, during the anglo Sikh wars, um, uh, the British found a gutka in one of the tents. And we were oh able to reproduce it using photogrammetry software. So really quite detailed. You know, uh, with the pattern. So, am I right? Did, that's like a it's like a leather cover, right? Yeah, it's it's kind of it's yeah, yeah it's a type of a leather there. But what we were also able to do is, um, um, we were able to sort of animate this and oh, open it wow, so you can actually that. see. And we haven't got all the pages, you know, all the ung in there, but you can actually see. Uh, but that's photographs of the actual pages, yeah, yeah. the actual so ung you can actually read being so I can superimposed here. there. And you can see this is actually Jopki Saib, yeah? Uh, yeah, I believe it's here. Yeah. And you can see it's Lodiwa. And this 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 was actually found uh, on the battlefield of the Angle Seagull, so it probably belonged to one of the sheets in that, in that battle. Wow. So being able to share this with uh, everyone and tell that story is is, is really is really special. Like, and, and yeah, really like honored to being able to do like stuff like this work on stuff like this because like you know this is this this can be there for generations now yeah um you know and so it's really cool to be able to do this so these all these artifacts that we've got on here this kandar pistol from nottingham their museum so it's a kandar with a with a pistol in it um you know, oh, wow. and what i was talking about with it, Tico, so let me ask you a question real quick because yeah. so um I was IT before I got into real estate and kind of similar to you. I, I had self-taught, 
you know, PHP programming, MySQL database, um, you know, Microsoft SQL server, like all this kind of stuff, kind of ASP. I was teaching myself and I became good enough at it that I was able to have a job where I did that for a living. Yeah. Um, but it all came from all the sick key stuff, right? I was doing yeah. all the websites and I had self-taught. Yeah. But uh, the company that I worked for, they did this kind of 3D modeling for the big three car companies, GM, Chrysler, and Ford. Yeah. And one of the things that they used to do is like they would take a Ford F-150 and recreate the F-150 in a, a 3D model, but with all the physics and things of the real one. And now they would crash that like 10,000 times into a wall at 60 miles per hour to see what happens. How does the metal crumple? Mm. Um, what, what happens to the windows? What happens to the seats? But in order to do that, they had to have the physical properties programmed in that this is this kind of steel, this is this thick, the, you know, this part is glass, you know, whatever it is. And those properties are programmed in. So when they crash it, it's recreating an actual crash. And now they have, they can crash 10,000 virtual trucks and not have, and only crash one yeah. for the initial test. When you're doing these kinds of 3D models, like I, I'm looking at that Kunda you just showed and it's metallic. You know, it has that shine to it. Is does it ha is it does it have the qualities of metal? Yeah. in the programming. So, so uh, it, it actually does. Yeah. So um, we use something called uh, physically based shaders. So they're basically they they they're kind of materials that are based on actually physical properties. So we actually right. do have a metalness value. Uh, we do have a, a like a, a roughness value, and we do have a color value. So these are all separated out. And so what the engine's able to do is actually use those different uh, different textures, different maps that you've painted or that you've put together and uh, pretty much um, replicate any sort of material that you can think of that is physically possible in the real world. Right. And which is... So, so for example, like just I'm well. thinking like, yeah, but I'm thinking like in the future, let's say I come up with a haptic feedback glove yeah. for virtual reality. Mm -hmm. If I, the way that model is already designed yeah. and it's in that world, I could go and touch it and say, oh, I can feel this is metal. This is yeah. leather. This is vel velvet. You know, I mean, that, I'd be able to feel the different qualities. Not there yet, but I mean, I, I, I would say it's getting there and we've already got yeah. like haptic feedback in VR uh, technologies, suits coming in as well. Um, you know, various different ways of doing it through vibration or through force feedback. Um, yeah. And the, 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 it is getting there, but I think what it is like if I was to take one of those three D models, I think where where the, it gets really exciting is that I can three D print it at full uh, any size I want, like in it, so I could actually do a real yeah. size replica of a sword. But then I would have to sort of like paint it and you know um, put the material yeah to on give it there. that look. But uh, but I mean, in theory, in the future, a sophisticated enough three D printer that has the materials available to it. 100%. Could yeah. say, okay, I'm printing this part in steel. Yeah. I'm printing this part yeah. in wood. Yeah. I'm printing this part in copper. You know, whatever. If it had the, yeah. like in theory, definitely. No, no, I, I think that's we're not far off that because uh, metal 3D printers exist now. They're just quite crude mm -hmm. at the moment. They're not like uh, they're not able to do really intricate stuff, and you know they're still a bit. So it's still getting there. But I would say within the next five to six years, we will have yeah. metallic 3D printers. You'll be able to 3D print a um a full sword you know you'll be able to 3d print wow. a handle i mean i've printed a uh, sword handles of 3d printed guitars and it's a lot, lot yeah. of fun uh, 3d printing one of those and then that's awesome you know, I'm, I'm, I, what i'm working on at the moment is just like how do we once we've got that 3d model in the physical world and it's just a great physical model how do we then like paint that and uh surface that so that it looks real looks metallic even though it's not yet because right Replicas are really important. I think, you know, creating replicas, we had uh, one of Maharaji, Maharani Jindako's earrings, um, and we right. were able to create a replica of it, pretty much 3D print all the different parts. And the only bit that we wow. didn't 3D print was the wire work, but we could have got somebody, a jeweler, to do the wire work for us. And so we yeah. would have had an exact replica. And I think that we need to go, start moving in that direction so that if at the Gurdwaras we can have replicas of Guru Gobind Singh Ji's armor, we can have replicas of, you know, our artifacts. So young people can have access to them. I mean, we can do it virtually. We're doing it online now already on mobile yeah. phones. You know, you could you could go on there and you can project that any one of those items into your living room. And 
you know and then, and then when we're looking at the vr spaces with the meditation chamber we're looking at um you know uh, different scenarios for that we're looking at virtual gurdwaras as well um you know metaverse gurdwara where you can you know everyone can step in you know it's a persistent space where everyone can right. step in you know yeah, I mean, Metaverse is already trying to do this with like clubs. Yeah, yeah. If you could do it for a club, you could do it for Gurdwara, yeah. right? So, yeah. Wow, that's um, so yeah. incredible. So we're, we're working on some stuff around there. I mean, it's, for us, it's all like time and money. We we have to we have right. to progress slowly, and obviously, we've got to do what we've got to do to keep things running in the business. With Mara just get a bar, you know, it's going really well, and then now we're we're sort of like you know this side of things is always moving. So we're working on like. Um, kids game characters working on little gaming concepts and stuff like that um, you know so we've actually got stuff we've actually got pro stuff that we've prototyped and we've got working and that's the stuff that we're going to hopefully put on Patreon soon and then say to the Sangat look if you want to see more of this sort of stuff uh, then yeah. you know then, then fund us because um, I, I, and I've got to say you know the, the Saib Jade film that came out of India was amazing I thought it was brilliant like I've been saying yeah. that like 20 years ago, I was talking about animations and I was just so glad and it had such an amazing impact. But at the same time, I would say that um, we can still go further. We can still go better. And like this sort of like media that we consume in the West, I think we need a different type of animation, like in it, something that's a bit more darker, a bit more real, a bit more realistic and a bit more raw. And yeah, from what I understand, though, a lot of that comes down to budget, right? Yeah. Like, if you have these 3D models, you can render them cheaply, mm. or you can render them very expensive with a lot of detail and yeah. a lot of the physics in place, you know? So um, really, but that's, that's really cool. I, and, but I really appreciate all the efforts that, you know, any, anyone's made. Any, I think when anyone does anything, anyone tries to do something, you should always encourage them. You should never put them down. You should encourage. You should always yep. encourage them because look, they're trying to do something out of their sharda, you know, out of their PR for the guru. And I think that when somebody is doing that, you know, you should never put anyone down and you should always commend them for their efforts or, you know, yeah. what they're doing. Because literally we're all trying to do the same thing, aren't we? We're all doing it for right. the same guru and it. we're all trying to show everyone the beauty of what we what we get from Sikhi. And uh, so uh, we all, yeah, and, and our stories and our um figures and history and stuff, they're no less than anybody else's, yeah, right. And 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 um, actually, this is something uh, again, in my last episode with Gurmeet Banji, she talked about the children's books she produced, and they're they're very, they're, they first of all, they have watercolor artwork, mm-hmm. very well done, they have hard covers to them, they're printed on very high quality glossy papers. And one of the points she made was, um, when people were giving gifts at baby showers and stuff, you know, the Punjabi kids books were printed on really poor yeah. materials and stuff. They were cheap. And then the American stuff or the, you know, whatever they're, they're very high quality. Yeah. And then for the child, there is a perception of, um, this is better than this. My stories are not as good as their story. Mm, exactly. So when you equal that playing field and say, look, we have the same quality content then all of a sudden the actual content starts to feel that much more amazing, especially to a child. Yeah. And, and I love all these books because I've got, I've got kids myself and I love all this content that's being produced. The books, yeah. children's books, amazing like in it because I mean, think about it. You want to teach your kids about Sikhi, but we've got no content, got nothing in your hands to be able to show them. And we've got Harry right. Potter. We've got, you know, yeah. Teletubbies and, but being able to show them like and, and these books that everyone's working on is just amazing. Really, I absolutely love it. Uh, yeah. And uh, you, know, you know, and then before I let you go though, there is one other thing I, I saw you were experimenting with, and I don't know if this is something that you're producing or you're just using other tools. But there's that the AI, yeah, the artificial intelligence artwork, yeah, which was fast. I'm looking at it and I'm like, God, there's something so. Like it draws you in and you look at it, but at the same time, you're like, this is some creepy psychotic stuff. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It, it, it <laughs> it's be, like this weird. <laughs> it can be quite scary. And um, yeah, it, it's quite scary, some of it. But I think what it is, it's, it's like an AI engine. You access it via like a console. So you working mm. with an online cloud server. And what you're doing is you're feeding it, um, you're, you're feeding it in uh, images and keywords. So you feed it in okay. images and keywords. And then what it's doing is trying to interpret that. 
and then create a new image from from that. And that's what it's doing. Like completely new. It's not like it's combining it, the stuff that's in there. It's creating something it's totally tr- new. Trying to create something new, and it doesn't always get it right. I mean, still, it's still in early stages at the moment. But I mean, it's yeah. quite, it's quite uh, really interesting. I, I just saw, I came across it, and I was like, I've got to try this. I've got to see what it can do. So I just fed in a load of like uh, seek keywords and seek I- images into it just to see what would come out and that now what, what it was producing and like it you can tell that it doesn't really understand like uh face and at the start in it because he just can't reproduce that it doesn't understand it doesn't have no concept yeah. of at the start and this is where it's meant to go so while it's great yeah at the same time it still needs that human interpretation and it still needs that human intent as well uh so yeah. while it's a good tool i think it's a good tool to use yeah to generate stuff uh if you're making like horror films and scary stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like monsters, a scary fairy tale like or something. <laughs> but I think it's, uh, yeah, <clears throat> but, I, I think that's all it is. It's just like a tool that you could maybe use. There's some of the, I think out of 100 images, you'd come out with about three interesting images maybe. Um, yeah, but still, it's it's fun to experiment yeah, and then it can, it gets your creative juices going 100%. too. But even still, um, you could, like a child, a small child, you could show them a bunch of pictures and say, okay, now you draw something out of your imagination, you know, and imagine what, uh, what are they capable of doing? Like how much are they going to be able to take the information you gave them and come up with yeah. something? And what is it going to look like? It's almost, this almost seems like, you know, um, a very, very talented infant. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it is definitely. Yeah. Very, very interesting. And it's being developed uh, even more now. Um, and like, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. I think we've got interesting sort of 10 years ahead where, you know, the new tech, wearable tech is going to be coming out you can have yeah. contact lenses which can do augmented reality augment objects you know might be a time where we don't need screens anymore it's just a virtual screen that travels with us right you know uh, because it can it can just put it in 3d space and you know right. all, all that's kind of doable now with tablets and uh vr headsets and as soon as the wearable tech comes in it's just going to translate across to that. So we're, we're quite well. Yeah. I mean, even some cars are doing it, right? They have yeah. the heads up display on their windshield already. That's augmented reality, essentially. Definitely. Yeah. And then, then you've got um, the glasses for people who ride motorbikes. So they've actually got glasses now that you oh. can buy and they will augment, you know, the, the directions, the distance, yeah. all those types of things into the helmet. Um, but I, I think it, it'll come into the mainstream when it becomes more accessible and when it becomes cheaper. The same way the Quest, you know, the Meta Quest headset yeah. made uh, vr more accessible because you don't have to have loads of cables you don't have to have a powerful machine right it will just work off there so that same thing yeah. so i'm really excited to kind of explore it a lot more especially in terms of sikhi because i know um a lot of geeks are starting to use vr now and getting interested in it and i'm having some really interesting conversations with people who've got really crazy ideas and we're actually developing a couple of uh, concepts at the moment um you know Probably oh, awesome. them, like within the next sort of six to eight months. Um, oh, wow. You know, I really like look forward to that. Gurdwaras and things like that, the virtual reality Gurdwara. Well, imagine being able to talk how to do Maharaj Seva in VR. So there's no right. chance that you can do any VR VR, uh, you know, but you're. Right, ready. right. That's that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Like, you don't have to worry about doing something wrong yeah. or, or, or being disrespectful. I mean, there's still going to be some people that are going to say, okay, even then, you know, you have to be careful. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, and you should, but it's a way to learn. That's the whole point. Learn, it becomes yeah. a way to learn. And, and I, th- I think and, so we, we, every industry that gets disrupted by it, and I think uh, we're going to have the same thing where it's going to disrupt the way that things have traditionally been done. There's always a bit yeah. of pushback. So even when we went to the museums and started to do VR, there was a bit of pushback from the creators because they thought this is going to take people out of the museums and move them into VR, and then they're not no longer going to come to the museum. But we actually said the opposite. Actually, if people are able to access your objects, your collections, there you're you're generating fans you're generating interest in your content and those people are going to be yeah. coming back more and more and then you're able to engage with them more and more and it's about engagement it's about getting people involved it's not about sort of this is our stuff and you can't touch it but i think with right. as well i think th- there's these conversations going on and i know i'm having these conversations with a lot of people where i'm having to reassure people where they're saying like oh well this is not this is not real sun this is not real bart this is not real you know and I say, well, no, it's not. Yeah, and it's not meant to be. It's not meant to replace what we already have. Nothing can replace, you know, being in Sangat, being with other people and doing Simran, doing Kirtan in Sangat. Not, not, nothing's ever going to take us away from that. 
Uh, but well, well, no, we don't know that. It, how, who's to say that's the real thing? How yeah. do we know we're not already in yeah, yeah, some I, kind of virtual I, simulation I like already? Like you know, you, like it's, as well, yeah. But but the thing is, I what I what I say to people is, I like, look when when audio recordings came out and people started audio recording yeah. keep, then people were like, well, oh, it's not like the real thing in it. But it's right, such a right. useful tool, isn't it? It's the, right. You know, if I couldn't be there, at least I could listen to you know the latest sort of keep them that happened no not only that like the yeah. one thing that audio recordings did is because you could listen to it over and over and over all of a sudden you were able to memorize the shabbats you heard exactly whereas you wouldn't have been able to do that listening one time at the gurdwara having that you wouldn't have been able to memorize yeah. that that gurvani now listening to the same tape over and over and over you start to memorize all that gurvani and then I know, then videos came and then everybody said, oh, video is bad, turn the video off, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. just listen to the audio. <laughs> you know, all you need is the audio. Yeah, <laughs> and now, now people are going to be like, oh, stop all this virtual reality, yeah, yeah, just yeah. watch the video. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's inevitable though, everyone's going to be using it. Um, it's going gonna, it's gonna yeah. to kind of just it, it pervade every sector, you know, it's going to be, it's because it's such, just such a useful tool. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, if we don't move into there, we're, we've got a chance that we'll lose a lot of people because we have got no content in that space. So, uh, we right. Need to be, right. And they're going to go to it anyway, yeah, gonna outside of Siki. So might as well be on the cutting edge of it. Or, not only not on the cutting edge, you know what? I think six can be the cutting edge. Yeah. I, and, and this, I honestly, this happened with sick websites. Yeah. Um, there was, there was, there was most websites were Christian and second, most websites were sick at one yeah. point. We were, we were at the cutting edge. I can tell you this too. In 1996 or 97, I can't remember what year, I started putting Kirtan as MP3s. Yeah. Nobody was doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody was doing real audio and everybody was getting mad at me because MP3s were 10 times larger yeah, yeah, yeah. than the real audio file. Yeah, yeah. But I had a cable modem. We were one of the beta testers for cable modems in Columbus at Ohio wow. State. So I had this cable modem. I could upload the... Uh, you know, a hundred megabyte file yeah. in, in in a minute, and I could download them in you know a couple of minutes. So yeah. I was I, like, I, I remember this that. is the future. I remember downloading from uh, your website an MP3. Uh, I was down. This is 1997, and I think it was by a free thing. It was one of his kids, and then I was downloading it. Yeah, and I was on a I was on a dial up. Yeah, and I was there. And it was <laughs> that nice. Yeah, you would let you would download for an hour and a half. Yeah, yeah. Let no, it just I was go. There for two hours. Yeah, watching this download speed. Yeah, and it was like a kilobyte. <laughs> And then right at the end, yeah, I lost my connection, and uh, oh. I got cancelled. I was like, oh no! <laughs> oh, so I went man. back again, and I got it in the end. Yeah, but it's like it's like yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. And not only that, like I remember too, like um, the MP3 logo. So I had made it. I yeah. made an M because there was no, I didn't have anything to use, you know. So I took a CD picture of a CD, and I just put like a black outline on white letters that said MP3 in the middle, you know, so people could distinguish from other things. And after some time, I started seeing that little uh, icon showing up on all kinds of websites yeah. outside of sick websites, you know, like other people were downloading, using that to represent MP3. So in the same way, like the stuff that you were doing then <laughs> and the stuff you're doing now, it's cutting edge and six can be leading that cutting edge. You know, we, uh, we, I don't, I don't like the idea of everybody else is going to move on and then we're going to play catch up. I, I actually think we are because we see the value of it now, mm. right? Because Siki is a funny thing. Um, Siki is this very traditional, modern thing, yeah. <laughs> right? Right. So we are so proud of the traditions, the way we do our pot, uh, you know how we how we do Amr Sanjar, um, how we treat Bana, um, you know, like how we. Um, remember all the Arda and the Ardas, we remember the Gurus and the Shaheeds, we remember the history. We don't let go of any of that. We're doing Chor Seva, you know, and Baba Jitabya because of the traditional way a king was treated. This is not how a king today is treated, yeah. right? So we're doing that, but we are very modern thinkers. Yeah. We're always looking to the head because we know that, that that technology, that cutting edge is how we can preserve that tradition also. So it's a very odd combination that we have as six and that's what propels us forward i think definitely and, and i think as well that we are always we there's there's always not very many of us as well 
Right. And so that right. creates that sort of uh, urgency and, you know, um, you know, and that, that's where the innovation happens in it. It's when you, mm. you know, and, and for us, I can say from us here as well, like we've been doing this sort of stuff 25 years now. And it's like the innovation happens because, you know, we're struggling because there's there's like we're trying to communicate with people and it's not working. So we started to build websites, started to communicate in different ways. We started to do right. MP3. You know, we're not understanding Gurbani. So, you know, we've got websites now with translation. So I think, yeah. And, and I, even now, like we're looking, we're looking at actually the artifacts. Yeah. Our artifacts are just spread mm. around everywhere. Yeah. We're not in a very good situation. They're in private collections. There's probably Guru Gobind Singhji stuff, you know, all in private collections, mm. which we don't even know about. Right. And what we were trying to create was the atmosphere of, look, we, we don't want to take it off you. We don't want to steal it back. Just let us digitize it and let us just share it with people. And so some private collectors actually came forward and actually gave us their content so we could actually scan it, wow. and preserve it. And I think this sort of digital preservation, I think, could be done with the buildings in India as well. So, you know, you know we've had a lot of heritage being destroyed. Right. We could we should be scanning those places and creating virtual environments. So if you want to see, you know, Bob Batal, with the original frescoes and original paintings, we can recreate that. Right. I could, I know I could do that. Yeah, if I had the right, right information, the right people informing me, the right historians working with me, I know I can recreate pretty much anything. Um, yeah. So yeah, or, or, you know, we we need to. It's been a, it's it's kind of like being a bit of a um, difficult to get people to understand what what it is that we're trying to do and the, the power of what it could be. And I think, but once they get it, yeah, I mean, imagine a nun for some. In its original form, you know, Vasaki's happening. What it must have been like with how everybody's gathered around and and bunch better come, like yeah. imagine that landscape. You, you're not going to be able to access that yeah. today, right? So being able to recreate it in a virtual environment, you can relive those moments. Hundred percent. That's really amazing. And 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 the thing is, I, I just look at how, the amount of money that's wasted in our communities on buildings. Like, and we extend yeah. buildings, we yeah. build bigger buildings, and I'm like, you know what? I I don't. I don't really fund those type of things anymore. I refuse to do it. What I yeah. what I'm more interested in is if somebody's doing an interesting project or doing something that's gonna help my kids learn Sikhi or getting get get closer to the guru, uh, I will fund that instead. So I always say advise right. people and I'd say to people, uh, don't fund the building funds, don't fund the right. Gurdwara, we don't need buildings, you know, uh, we need content, we need innovation, we right. need exciting fun you know things for our kids, kids to engage with yeah that are related to Sikhi and related to the guru that's gonna sort of inspire them um i i would rather you fund that those types of projects like in it and there's so many I, I, one thing i love is there's so many great like young people out there doing some amazing stuff like in it it warms your heart like to see that um mm -hmm. you know they, they're all in their own little fields in their own little areas they're doing this, somebody working on Raagitan and preserving that. You know, right. somebody's working on, you know, children's books, which is amazing. You know, somebody's yeah. working on two animations of, of you know, Mata Saib Gore and, you know, all these kind of things are, you know, all helping. And, you know, they, they, we can't do, they, you can't do enough in it, you know. There's always like, right. so much more to do. But, um, yeah, it's, it's... Well, I appreciate all that you do. I, your work is amazing. Um, I Thank hope uh, people will go check out a little bit more of it and see what what it's what we're actually talking about. It's hard to talk about it, and you know people need to look at it and experience it. <clears throat> but you're doing it for Siki, you know, like you're doing it for the betterment of Siki. You're doing it for the future of Siki, um, the, especially that preservation work. It's it's amazing work. It, it you've done a great job, and you know it's it's fun. You know, like when I reached out to you, I just had, I knew, I knew you were the same guy. I just wanted to confirm you're the same <laughs> Dutton Singh 3D artist from back then. Cause I'm like, I got to watch. Cause I remember when you did that 3D, uh, Guru Granth Sahib model with the light. And I remember that and it became, it became very iconic. It was, everybody was using that. And to see your work evolve over all that time into the kind of stuff you're doing now. Absolutely amazing. It's awesome work. You've done a great job. Oh, thanks. Appreciate. Yeah. Well, thank you for coming on today. I really enjoyed talking to you. Um, come back anytime you want. Um, <laughs> you, next time, maybe when your next project comes out, six, eight months or whatever, 
we could talk then and you, you could do another exclusive reveal yeah, yeah. <laughs> podcast. Hundred yeah. percent. We could talk about it. All right. Awesome thing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. Why would you call